Uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts, working our way through it. I am super excited to be able to start us off to prepare us as we uh, begin to think through some of the themes that we're going to come across, as we begin to think through uh, what this will be teaching us as a church. But I want to, I want to start here. Over six years ago, Joe and I decided to move to the Wirral to join this church. Uh, when we had been visiting over the course of the, the many months before uh, and praying through, we had we come to realize that, that this was a church that was all about reaching the Wirral. It was a church that was seeking to plant gospel outposts all over the Wirral and to the ends of the earth. That is, that is who we are. That is what we are about and I, I fondly remember Josh driving us. It was our first weekend coming up to visit uh, in February 2017. And Josh was driving us around. Uh, and if you listen to any of the podcasts, um, you would have heard of these tour of worlds uh, that we did. Um, but it was, uh, it was a formative time for us. Because as we drove around this place that we had never been to before, uh, Josh was able to say, here's a place that, that there's no gospel preaching church. There's no gospel centered church here. We need one here. Here is, we've got a, a community of, of people that are, that, are, that are living in this area, and our hope is that they will form into a, a gospel community. But there's no gospel center, there's no gospel preaching church in this area, and we need that to change. And I fondly remember those conversations. It was, it was part of those conversations that, that, that transformed our, our desire to, to come, to be part of the mission and ministry here at Cornerstone Wirral. This was a church that was young, now, we're only 10 years old, but already it was heading in the direction of raising and training leaders. It was a church that, that preached the whole gospel, a church that was willing to see what the Holy Spirit could do, revealing and empowering a, a people to proclaim the excellencies of Christ to the world. And it was exciting. There was a buzz in the air. There was a buzz in the air. People were gospeling one another. People were sharing their lives together. Lives were being transformed and people were being added to the church year after year. And that is where we are at now. People are being added year after year because that journey continues. That mission continues. And we continue to see gospel fruit each and every week to the praise of his glory and his grace. It was clear that this God's people was a church that were generous and sacrificial in their gifts, their times, their abilities. This was a church that was wanting to see the gospel to go out to their friends, to their family members across the whole region. And it's been clear in these past six years for us that the gospel works best when you live where you live, when you worship where you live, when you engage with the people intentionally in your life where you live. And it's also been clear that for some of you, who are worshipping where you don't live, where you're seeking to be intentional with the people in your life where you don't live, that you are feeling the, the pain of not being with your brothers and sisters on a day-to-day -day basis, when you're having to travel away from where those people are in order to meet together with God's people. If you've been with us for any amount of time, you will know that it is our heart to make disciples and to mature disciples so that we can seek to reach the 330,000 people that live in the world and help them come to know and follow Jesus. One of the ways that we strategically see that happening is through the multiplication of gospel outposts, the multiplication of, of gospel communities in areas where there are none, the multiplication of, of churches where there are none, gospel-centered, gospel-preaching churches where they are missing. And so as a church, we encourage and, and we seek the health and the vitality of, of other gospel-preaching, gospel-centered churches throughout the world. And it's so timely that tonight is the night that we are going to be gathering together, partnering together, standing side by side with other gospel preaching, gospel-believing, gospel-centered churches and their members as we pray together and as we praise God together, praying for the different areas across the world in which each of us minister and declare and display the gospel of Jesus. We 
long to see churches revitalized. We long to see them hunger after God. We long to see them want to share Jesus with the people where they are. We long to see churches planted where there are none because Irby is different to Bevington. North Birkenhead is different to Bevington. Cheshire and South Wirral is different to Bevington. The ferries are different to Bevington. And, and friends and family who don't know Jesus will rarely come to Bevington whenever they live elsewhere. And I know that is a pain that you guys have experienced over the years. Because you know that they will come along to a church whenever it's on their doorstep. They will, when they receive an invite from you, their friend or family member, often they will come along. We desire to see churches focused in on the people of the area in which they are based. That is where we want to be. We're not there yet. It will take time. We're only 10 years old. That is our heart. That is our desire to see. But what we want to see as we go through the book of Acts is the, that the Bible compels us to be this. The Bible compels us to do this, to be one church in, in many locations across the world, partnering with others to see the gospel reach the ends of the earth. And so that's one of the reasons why we're going to be looking at Acts over these next 12, 13 months. Now, before we dive into that, I want to share just two things and, and kind of help you engage with this. We're going to be taking our time over these 28 chapters. We could just take 28 weeks. Uh, we're going to take longer. Uh, I'm going to have little breaks in between, uh, so you, you won't be fully saturated just in Acts week after week. We'll have Christmas, we'll have Easter, we'll have a few other things in between. But we're going to be dividing it up into three sections, and I want to help you understand the, the flow and the narrative of that. Uh, and the, those sections are, are based on fulfilling the promises of Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And so that's chapters 1 to 7. That will be our first section. Then in Judea and Samaria, that's chapters 8 to 12. And that will be our next section. And then finally, to the ends of the earth. And that's going to be from chapters 13 all the way through to chapter 28. That's going to be our final section. And for some of those sermons, we're going to be focusing in on just maybe a couple of verses, a few verses. Whilst for other sermons, we're going to be going over the whole flow of the narrative. So let me encourage you to do this over these next few weeks. Take time to read through all of Acts. Because you're going to be better, more equipped, more prepared as you come each Sunday uh, to be able to engage with God's Word. To be able to engage with where we are leading in these sermons. Uh, the reason being, you'll we'll maybe skip over something um, and you'll be like, how on earth did this guy, Paul, be, like, where did he come from? Like, who, who's Paul? I knew a guy called Saul. Who's Paul? We want you to be able to know how those things happened, just in case those are the moments where we focus in on one or two verses. Secondly, there are people who consider the book of Acts uh, to be purely descriptive, to be purely a, a retelling of the story of what happened. And then there will be others who say, because the Bible is prescriptive in all that it is, and it is telling us what to do. I want to say that it is entirely both things. Uh, to say otherwise could be deemed foolish. And let me give you an example of that. At the end of chapter 1, if you look at your Bible, just at the end of chapter 1, the apostles, they're, they're seeking to, to find a replacement for Judas. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias. This is not prescriptive in the sense we're not going to be casting lots for new GC leaders. We're not going to be like just throwing them out and going, okay, it's you. You got it. The lot fell upon you. We're not going to be doing that. But it does show how the apostles trusted in the sovereignty of God. Maybe that's a good idea. Maybe we should do that. Maybe we should um, see what happens. What it does show is that the apostles trusted in the sovereignty of God. That is descriptive in the retelling of that, but it is also prescriptive in that we should be trusting in the sovereignty of God. 
And so we will see that the church is central to the plans and the purposes of God. It's, that's going to be the overarching narrative flow of the book of Acts, that God is sovereign, that God is in control, and that the church is central to the plans and to the purposes of God. We'll, we'll see that through how the Father and the Son sends the Holy Spirit to apply salvation to us, and then how he equips us and empowers us as the church for the mission of taking the gospel out to the ends of the earth, starting with those next door, starting with those who coming to Bebbington is too hard, is too far. It's not about growing in number to fill this building. It's about the gospel going out to the ends of the earth. It's about the people, God's people witnessing in Bebbington, in the towns and villages of the world, and then to the ends of the earth, wherever that takes us. We sit here today because the gospel has come to us. We have received it, and we are commissioned to keep on sharing it to the ends of the earth. You're going to hear me say that saying a lot. It's our subheading for this series, To the Ends of the Earth, and there's a reason for that. It is to drive home who we are as God's people. And that's why, that's why we're going to be spending such a long time in the book of Acts. So let's, let's go there now. Let's look at chapter 1 and the first five verses together. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with him, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Now, in your Bible, I don't know if your Bible has this, my Bible at the very top of the book of Acts says the Acts of the Apostles. That is to say that these are the acts that they did. These are the, the things that they did. You could say that, look, the, the writer of the book of Acts is seeking to give an orderly account, just like his first book, Luke's Gospel. That is Luke, in these first few verses, setting the tone of the book. But it would also be fair to say that Acts is about what Jesus has continued to do and continued to teach or the acts of the continued ministry and mission of Christ through his spirit-empowered church. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful, and that's a lot of ink. I don't want you scoring out everything in the heading of your Bible and writing that instead, but have that in mind as we seek to walk through Acts together over these months. It's not just a list of things that happened. It's not just in the genre of narrative history, like a history book. It's not just descriptive. It's God continuing to teach us through his spirit-inspired word. And so I want to just cover through some themes that we're going to experience over the course of these weeks and months. We're going to find ourselves grounded in God's sovereignty. We're going to see the purposes and plans of God worked out through his church. We're going to even see it understood by those who are anti-gospel, who are against the gospel, who want to cause harm to the gospel. For instance, in, in Acts 5, there's, there's a Jewish council. They're meeting together. It's almost like a court. They're meeting together to, to try and find out what are they going to do with, with Peter and the other apostles. And they, they see that the gospel is going, to, this news, this, this, this story of Jesus is going out to people. People are believing and responding and being transformed. And they don't know what to do about it. And an esteemed Pharisee, Gamaliel, he speaks up. And at the end of his kind of his discussion to everyone, he says this. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men. Leave them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow it. You might even be found opposing God. Even those opposing the apostles and their gospel saw how God's sovereignty was being played out. And we're going to see that happening throughout the course of our time in Acts. 
We're also going to see the gospel being clarified, being made clear for us. Uh, We're going to see the gospel of Jesus uh, being presented before us. Uh, All too often, uh, if you think back to our evangelism weekender, and we were asked to, what would you do if you were asked to share the gospel? Uh, And the vast majority of us kind of just like squirmed in our seats and and kind of tried to like whisper something to one another, fearful uh, that we weren't going to get it right. Too often we have an anemic definition of what the gospel is. Too often it might sound like, ask Jesus into your heart as your personal savior. God loves sinners and he died for them. And both of those statements are true to varying degrees, but they both fall short of the fullness of the gospel that's explained in God's word. The the gospel is the good news that Jesus is the king, that he's the Lord, that he's savior. And even that needs unpacking because there's so much depth in there. Here's a broader definition from throughout scripture. The gospel is the good news that the kingdom of God has come, that Jesus is the king, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, that he was resurrected in his great love and his great mercy for us. God the Father saves those who repent of their sin, who believe in the gospel, who follow Jesus. And when Jesus returns as king uh, over all things, and he returns on the day of judgment, everyone who has followed him will enter into the eternal kingdom of God. And those who have not will experience eternal judgment, which is what we all deserve but by the grace of God. That's a broader definition. It's a broader statement of the gospel, but there is so much more. And we're going to see throughout the book of Acts the gospel being preached. We're going to see the message of Jesus being the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament had to say, pointing to this moment being the the turning point of all of history. And we're going to see people's responses to it. We're going to see people mocking it. We're going to see people laughing at it. We're going to see people take offense to it. We're going to see people who have more questions. We're going to see people who believe. And time and time again, we are going to get to rejoice because we're going to hear the statement, more were added to their number. And we will rejoice. I get goosebumps every time I hear that. More were added to their number. Not only will we see the message of the gospel on display, but we'll also see the power of the gospel on display as the Spirit goes out to change hard hearts, blind eyes of mankind. We're going to witness some of the first sermons of the apostles that are recorded. Uh, Those who were fearful doubters, think Peter, to empowered, emboldened, courageous preachers. Just in a matter of of 40 days, something significant has changed, and we get to see what that is and why that is. We're going to see what they deem to be necessary, what they deem to be important, what they deem to be central doctrines of the gospel, and actually how that is to be applied to the church of Christ. Our understanding of, of... the role of the church, the function of the church, the mission of the church is going to be deepened. It's going to be grounded more so than ever before. Acts 1-8 again, you will be my witnesses in all of Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's, That's the role and the purpose of the church to be equipping the saints, to be witnesses of Christ to the ends of the earth. And this morning, if you were in our prayer meeting, Uh, Josh Robb shared with us from Acts 2 uh, what it looks like to be the church. In verses 42 to 47, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to to the fellowship, to the one another, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those that were being saved. It's amazing to see this picture of, of gospel community as they, as they gather together as, as one church in the temple and then scatter into homes, breaking bread together, praying together, being devoted to the apostles' teaching, to God's word 
together. We see other person-centered love lived out. We see them having favor amongst those around them. In fact, those around them look in and they see what's going on and they want to be involved, but they know that this is a distinct holy people and they fear being involved until they hear the gospel and their hearts are transformed. We see a hunger for God and his word that leads into action. And then as we come further on to Acts 9, we see the church having spread out from Jerusalem and it says this at the, at the end in verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. What happened? It multiplied. It multiplied. As we, as we worship where we live, as we gather with God's people where we live, as we devote ourselves to the word of God where we live, as we do life with our brothers and sisters where we live, as we draw people into that other person-centered community, it multiplies. It multiplies. God compels us through his word to be like this. This is what the church of God is to be like. And we're going to flesh that out as we take our time through this amazing book. But Acts is also going to push our thinking on some things. Uh, one thing is going to be the Holy Spirit. Some of you will be like, yes, it's about time that we got into this. I can't wait to discover and find out what the church thinks about the Holy Spirit. Uh, what about the gifts? I want to see all these signs and wonders. Um, some of you are freaking out. What on earth? I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what they're going to say. Let me say this. We are reading the Spirit-inspired Word of God. We are praying that, that He will illuminate our minds and our hearts to what He is doing. There are many signs and wonders performed by the apostles through our acts, and we're going to talk about them. We're going to work through them. But if you want to feel an understanding of where we're at as a church, we, we, we preached a series in 1 Corinthians uh, a number of years ago. I want to encourage you to go into our sermon archive online and have a listen to some of those sermons. Binge on those sermons over this next week uh, and, and you will get a feel of, of where we're at as a church in regard to that. I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to put a pin in that for now and we'll dive a little deeper as we get to that. We're also going to talk through and walk through the, the reality of persecution in the church. Throughout Acts, the gospel goes out, lives are transformed, the church grows. We're going to see responses to the gospel that are just downright ugly. Just downright ugly. But God wants us to understand that, that these are things that we should expect and things that we should not be surprised at. Persecution will come. Throughout the New Testament, we see that reminder. Persecution will come. Trials of many kinds will come, and there are brutal persecutions of Christians contained within Acts. False imprisonment, beatings, murder, being stoned, and the massed forced dispersion of all Christians from Jerusalem. But what we need to see is that despite the persecution, and even through the persecution, we see God's word advancing, and more and more being added to their number with responses of belief in the gospel of Jesus. And that's why elsewhere the apostles can say, we rejoice in our sufferings. We are content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, because the gospel continues to go out and bear fruit. Constant, we need to hear that message. And because we live in a post-Christian world, we live in a post-Christian country, and we are beginning to see more and more, year after year, of the increasing, sometimes militant, secularism. And we need to be shaken, at times, out of our comfortable stupor, because we think we're okay. We're beginning to see, and we have seen, a push on, on identity issues, a push on sexual orientation, on, on parental roles, on, on fundamentalist views, of chauvinistic views being rammed down as, as something against Christians. 
we're beginning to feel the pinch. But friends, it's, it's only a pinch in comparison and to what our brothers and sisters are experiencing in the world around us. The barbaric abuses that people are experiencing, the beheadings, the being steamrolled over because they believe in Jesus. But we are feeling the pinch. And we need to know what it means to follow Jesus in the midst of that. We need to know what it means to carry our cross in the midst of that, in the midst of those times together and for one another. And Acts is going to help us understand that. Throughout our time in the book of Acts, we will just naturally be motivated for mission. We will naturally be motivated for multiplication. We will want to see the continuation of what's going on in this book and want to see it replicated and continue. As the gospel is preached, as, as, as people hear the gospel, they respond to the gospel and more and more are added to the number. And we need to be a people that are praying for that. That the gospel goes out, that people hear it, that people respond to it, and people come to faith in it. We will be stirred. We will be shaken to be a people that, that move out for the sake of the gospel, that move from our comfortable community to take the gospel out to the places that need it. Our time in Acts is going to challenge the comfortable change-resistant desires of our hearts and create within us a church that, that goes, a church that sends, a church that plants, a church that drives health, a church that builds up, But throughout all of that, we will see that the mission is hard. It's not an easy mission. There is resistance to that mission. We're going to see ethnic challenges throughout Acts, where Jews and Gentiles come together and they find it hard to relate to one another, but for the gospel. We're going to see political challenges of what it means to live for King Jesus in a world, in, a, in, a, in an arena where, where Caesar was to be regarded as the king, as supreme, as, as to be worshipped. And how people are, are to work through that. There were social challenges in the church with, with people who were poor and, and slaves and people who were masters and, and rich. There was challenges with space. Because more and more are being added to their number. They, they don't have a, a church building. They, they're gathering in marketplaces and temple courtyards. And the more and more that add to their number, sometimes we hear of 5,000 at a time. Can you imagine if 5,000 people just rocked up on a Sunday morning here? The problem that we would have for space, but we would make something happen. We would make something happen. It would be very warm in here. But it would be such a blessing. There were challenges The apostles had to delegate tasks to others because as more and more were being added, the the needs of the people were being added as well. The needs of the people were were so great and it was affecting the time that they were able to to devote to God's word and to prayer. The book of Acts, it it affirms so wonderfully, so beautifully, the co-laboring of men and women together. The gospel affirming even before Feminist movements began that actually equality and co-laboring together for the sake of the gospel is crucial. And we will see that it's hard. We will see that working through those things can be hard, can can have tensions arise. But through it all, we will see that overarching thing, that God is sovereign. That God is sovereign. And so through Acts, we are going to be a people that are encouraged. We're going to be a people that are equipped. We're going to be a people that are comforted. We're going to be a people that are perhaps challenged in our heart and in our mind. As we learn from this, this narrative and as we begin to apply it into our context, which is different. As we seek to apply it into our context today as a church. And through it all, we need to be reminded that these are the acts of the continued ministry and mission of Christ through his Spirit-empowered church. Jesus builds his church. The Spirit and the Word of God, they do the work of 
saving. They do the work of, of multiplying. And we get to be faithful workers, empowered by the Spirit in prayer and in action, to go out and into the ends of the earth. Today, this is simply a moment to introduce you to what we are going to see in this book of Acts. We are going to continue diving into this over these, these weeks ahead. But it is our prayer that we will be a prepared people, that we will be a people that is ready to learn and ready to receive and ready to trust in all that God is leading us into. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you so much for your grace, for your mercy, for your loving kindness that you sent Jesus into the world to, to live in this world, that Luke could record all of his actions, all of his words, all that he did on the cross for us. And Lord God, I thank you that Luke was able to write down all of the things that Jesus would continue to do, that he would continue to teach, that he would continue to work through his spirit in part church. And so Lord God, I pray that as we spend time over these next months in this wonderful book, that you would teach us, that you would lead us, that you would guide us, that you would compel us to know what it looks like to be a spirit-empowered church, a church that is trusting in your sovereignty and in your plans and purposes for us.